the egyptian and tibetan books of the dead are two ancient and enlightening tomes revealing the complex afterlife beliefs of two fascinating religions the egyptian book of the dead also known as the book of coming forth by day originally was not a book at all but rather a collection of hieroglyphics carved or painted on pyramid walls the oldest known version is estimated over five thousand years old and was found in the tomb of a king buried in abydos during egypt's mid dynasties the book of the dead was more often inscribed into sarcophaguses than on pyramid walls and in later dynasties usually written on papyrus scrolls buried inside the coffin the egyptians believed that after physical death our material body, known as the Khat, would produce an etheric double body, known as the Ka. In the afterlife state, inhabiting our new etheric body, we wander about the earth plane at will for a period of time. The recently deceased is always identified with the god Osiris, and frequently called by the god's name. Eventually, the deceased is brought to judgment, which is the main and most important feature of the Egyptian afterlife experience present at the judgment are several gods of the egyptian pantheon such as the ibis-headed thoth the dog-headed anubis and the crocodile-headed amet devourer of the dead at the center of the scene stand the scales of justice where anubis weighs the heart of the recently deceased on one side balanced with a single feather on the other side known as the feather of truth thoth the scribe stands to the side recording the results while Emmet, the devourer of the dead, waits under the scale to perform his task. If the heart weighs equal to or less than the feather, the deceased is said to be pure and may continue their journey towards immortality. However, if the heart outweighs the truth feather, it was deemed impure, and Emmet would immediately devour their heart, leaving them without a soul. To prepare for this afterlife judgment, the Egyptian Book of the Dead recommends the recitation of forty-two negative confessions of specific sins they did not commit during their lifetime, one for each of the forty-two gods present in the Hall of Osiris. By reading what ancient Egyptians considered sinful, it is clear they abhorred abuse, adultery, promiscuity, cheating, thievery, fraud, violence, and murder. A pious Egyptian endeavored to not curse the gods, not speak haughtily, not judge hastily, and not stir up strife. They sought to give food to the hungry, drink to the thirsty, clothes to the naked, and boats to shipwrecked mariners. The forty-two negative confessions recited during judgment, such as, I have not stolen, would later appear in Christianity's Ten Commandments, such as, Thou shalt not steal. The Egyptian Book of the Dead states, I have not committed sin, I have not committed robbery with violence. I have not stolen, I have not slain men and women, I have not stolen grain, I have not purloined offerings, I have not stolen the property of God, I have not uttered lies, I have not carried away food, I have not uttered curses, I have not committed adultery, I have not lain with men, I have made none to weep, I have not eaten the heart, I have not attacked any man, I am not a man of deceit, I have not stolen cultivated land, I have not been an eavesdropper. I have not slandered any man. I have not been angry without just cause. I have not debauched the wife of any man. I have not polluted myself. I have terrorized none. I have not transgressed the law. I have not been wroth. I have not shut my ears to the words of truth. I have not blasphemed. I am not a man of violence. I have not been a stirrer up of strife. I have not acted with undue haste. I have not pried into matters. I have not multiplied my words in speaking. I have wronged none. I have done no evil. I have not worked witchcraft against the king. I have never stopped the flow of water. I have never raised my voice. I have not cursed God. I have not acted with arrogance. I have not stolen the bread of the gods. I have not carried away the kenfu cakes from the spirits of the dead. I have not snatched away the bread of a child, nor treated with contempt the god of my city. I have not slain the cattle belonging to the god. I have not repulsed God in his manifestations. I am pure. I am pure. I am pure. 
The judgment and afterlife journey described in the Egyptian Book of the Dead paints a psychedelic picture of their mysterious religion, and actually shares many similarities with Tibetan Buddhism and their Book of the Dead written thousands of years later. The Tibetan Book of the Dead, also known as the Liberation Through Hearing During the Intermediate State, was first orally preserved, then eventually written down in the 8th century. Both the Egyptian and Tibetan Books of the Dead were afterlife guides meant to be whispered into the ear of the dying and deceased by priests, monks, or close family members. They both speak of an etheric body that survives physical death, and freely travels the earth plane until eventually being brought to judgment for all sins committed during their lifetimes. The Tibetan Book of the Dead calls this etheric double the Thought Body of Propensities, and gives very specific details about what to expect starting from the moment of physical death, ending in the eventual reincarnation into a new physical body. Dr. Carl Jung wrote, The Tibetan Book of the Dead is a book of instructions of the dead and dying. Like the Egyptian Book of the Dead, it is meant to be a guide for the dead man during the period of his bardo existence, symbolically described as an intermediate state of forty-nine days' duration between death and rebirth. The text falls into three parts. The first part describes the psychic happenings at the moment of death. The second part deals with the dream state which supervenes immediately after death, and with what are called karmic illusions. The third part concerns the onset of the birth instinct and of prenatal events. It is characteristic that supreme insight and illumination, and hence the greatest possibility of attaining liberation, are vouchsafed during the actual process of dying. Soon afterward, the illusions begin, which lead eventually to reincarnation. The illuminative lights, growing ever fainter and more multifarious, and the visions more and more terrifying. This descent illustrates the estrangement of consciousness from the liberating truth as it approaches nearer and nearer to physical rebirth. The purpose of the instruction is to fix the attention of the dead man at each successive stage of delusion and entanglement on the ever-present possibility of liberation, and to explain to him the nature of his visions. In Buddhism, this intermediary state between death and rebirth is known as bardo, which symbolically lasts for forty-nine, seven times seven, days before the deceased is reincarnated. The ideal in Buddhism, however, and the guidance of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, is not to reincarnate here at all but rather to release all desires and attachments to the material world in order to reach a blissful state called nirvana, at one with the source. This would be considered a perfect death, rarely achieved, and generally requiring hundreds or thousands of reincarnations before succeeding. Buddhists believe a level of karmic purity and meditative awareness must be diligently practiced, usually over many lifetimes, before reaching nirvana. Otherwise, Shortly after physical death, a series of hallucinatory karmic illusions will beckon their attention and drag them down into increasingly darker delusions, resulting in progressively worse rebirths. Dr. Carl Jung wrote, At any rate, it is unexpectedly original, if nothing else, to find the after-death state, of which our religious imagination has formed the most grandiose conceptions, painted in lurid colors as a terrifying dream state of a progressively degenerative character. The supreme vision comes not at the end of the bardo, but right at the beginning, in the moment of death. What happens afterward is an ever-deepening descent into illusion and obscuration, down to the ultimate degradation of new physical birth. The spiritual climax is reached at the moment when life ends. Human life, therefore, is the vehicle of the highest perfection it is possible to attain. It alone generates the karma that makes it possible for the dead man to abide in the perpetual light of the voidness without clinging to any object, and thus to rest on the hub of the wheel of rebirth, freed from all illusion of genesis and decay. The Tibetan Book of the Dead emphasizes the importance of maintaining at the moment of physical death a meditative, undisturbed, pure state of consciousness free from desires and attachments to the material world. Spiritual adepts, able to transcend the trap of reincarnation, are promised not to experience the devolution of delusion into hallucinatory dream states, 
but to instead, quote, be set face to face with the fundamental clear light, and without any intermediate state, they will obtain the unborn dharmakaya by the great perpendicular path. A parallel teaching to this is found in the Hindu Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna tells Arjuna that one attaineth whatever state of being one thinketh about at the last when relinquishing the body, being ever absorbed in the thought thereof. If the deceased is unable to maintain meditation, clings to material attachments and desires, or has accrued too much negative karma, they will be thrust into a series of dreamlike illusions. The Tibetan Book of the Dead states, however, that these illusions all emanate directly from our own minds, and are a result of our own beliefs, preconceptions, and other subconscious factors. The bardos each person experiences are based on their own unique mental content, so a Buddhist would likely see visions of Buddha and the deities in their pantheon. A Christian would see Jesus and the Christian heaven, and a Viking would see the Norse gods and Valhalla. Sir John Woodruff wrote, The Bible of the Christians, like the Koran of the Muslims, never seems to consider that the spiritual experiences in the form of hallucinatory visions by prophet or devotee reported therein may, in the last analysis, not be real. But the Tibetan Book of the Dead is so sweeping in its assertions that it leaves its reader with the clear-cut impression that every vision, without any exception whatsoever, in which spiritual beings, God, or demons, or paradises, or places of torment and purgation play a part, in a bardo, or any bardo-like dream or ecstasy, is purely illusionary. The whole aim is to cause the dreamer to awaken into reality freed from all the obscurations of karmic illusions, in a supramundane or nirvanic state, beyond all phenomenal paradises, heavens, hells, purgatories, or world of embodiment. The Tibetan Book of the Dead states that upon the moment of physical death, the following passage should be whispered into their ear repeatedly. O nobly born, the time hath now come for thee to seek the path. Thy breathing is about to cease. Thy guru hath set thee face to face before with the clear light, and now thou art about to experience it in its reality, in the bardo state, wherein all things are like the void and cloudless sky, and the naked spotless intellect is like unto a transparent vacuum without circumference or center. At this moment know thou thyself, and abide in that state. Thine own consciousness, shining, void, and inseparable from the great body of radiance, hath no birth nor death, and is the immutable light. If the deceased is able to recognize their true nature as the clear light, and shed their mortal existence, the bardo ends immediately with their return to source in a state of nirvana. Otherwise, a series of self-created delusions begin to overtake their consciousness. The Book of the Dead continues, O nobly born, when thy body and mind were separating, thou must have experienced a glimpse of the pure truth, subtle, sparkling, bright, dazzling, glorious, and radiantly awesome, in appearance like a mirage moving across a landscape in springtime, in one continuous stream of vibrations. Be not daunted thereby, nor terrified, nor awed. That is the radiance of thine own true nature. Recognize it. Similar to an amputee with phantom limb syndrome, when the physical body dies, our consciousness still thinks and feels much like it did during life, creating dream states so convincing that many deceased people do not even realize that they are dead. Much like the Robin Williams movie, What Dreams May Come, the recently deceased often become so consumed with hallucinations related to their attachments and desires on the material plane that they may be in denial of their own death. For those who refuse the immutable clear light, the Book of the Dead claims they will now experience two more lights, first a good, true, blue light of the highest divine, and then a false white light of the devas, spiritual beings in Hindu and Buddhist mythology which relate to the archons or fallen angels of Gnostic Christianity. The Tibetan Book of the Dead continues, The wisdom of the Dharma Datu, blue in color, shining, transparent, glorious, dazzling from the heart of Verochana, as the father-mother, will shoot forth and strike against thee 
with a light so radiant that thou wilt scarcely be able to look at it. Along with it there will also shine a dull white light from the devas, which will strike against thee in thy front. Thereupon, because of the power of bad karma, the glorious blue light of the wisdom of Dharmadhatu will produce in thee fear and terror, and thou wilt wish to flee from it. Thou wilt beget a fondness for the dull white light of the devas. At this stage, thou must not be awed by the divine blue light, which will appear shining, dazzling, and glorious, and be not startled by it. That is the light of the Tathagata, called the light of the wisdom of the Dharmadhatu. Put thy faith in it, believe in it firmly, and pray unto it. Be not fond of the dull white light of the devas. Be not attached to it, be not weak. If thou be attached to it, thou wilt wander in the abodes of the devas, and be drawn into the whirl of the six lokas. That is an interruption to obstruct thee on the path of liberation. Look not at it. Look at the bright blue light in deep faith. For the next seven days, the recently deceased is tempted by seven different colored lights emanating from seven peaceful deities, each representing one of the seven chakras and one of the seven vices, including anger, pride, and jealousy. Depending on the accumulated karma of the recently deceased, they will feel irresistibly drawn towards the deity that represents their vice. The Book of the Dead insists to remain impartial and unattached to each emotion as it passes, or else be thrust and reincarnated into that world. For example, for those trapped by the light of jealousy, it says, A light of dull green color from the Asura Loka, produced from the cause of the feeling of jealousy, coming side by side with the wisdom rays, will shine upon thee. Meditate upon it with impartiality, with neither repulsion nor attraction. Be not fond of it. If thou art of low mental capacity, be not fond of it. Fear it not. Be not fond of that dull green light of the Asura Loka. That is the karmic path of acquired intense jealousy, which hath come to receive thee. If thou art attracted by it, thou wilt fall into the Asura Loka, and have to engage in unbearable miseries of quarreling and warfare. If we are attracted to the impure lights of these worlds, it says we will assume a body there, and lose our opportunity to be emancipated from the cycle of suffering. Each successive light, however, guarantees progressively worse rebirths, so the longer we remain lost in these karmic illusions, the more suffering we will have to endure. After the first seven days of the seven peaceful deities, the next seven days are controlled by seven wrathful deities. The Book of the Dead says these are actually the same seven deities, but with a changed aspect, so that they will not resemble themselves, and now they will use negative rather than positive reinforcement to lure us. Again we are reminded, though, not to fear or be in awe of these gods, because they are simply embodiments of our own intellect, aspects of our own consciousness. O nobly born, listen undistractedly, not having been able to recognize when the peaceful deities shone upon thee in the bardo above, thou hast come wandering thus far. Now on the eighth day, the blood-drinking, wrathful deities will come to shine. Act so as to recognize them without being distracted. After seven days of the peaceful deities and seven days of the wrathful deities, on the fifteenth day, the thought-body of propensities changes to a denser version of itself called the desire-body. This desire-body is given the powers of unimpeded motion and miraculous action meaning it can travel anywhere in an instant, and go straight through walls and other physical objects. We are even encouraged to test the desire body, to experience our new powers, and prove to ourselves that we must really be dead. O nobly born, thou art actually endowed with the power of miraculous action. Thou art able in a moment to traverse the four continents round about Mount Meru or thou canst instantly arrive in whatever place thou wishest. Thou hast the power of reaching there within the time which a man taketh to bend, or to stretch forth his hand. O nobly born, unimpeded motion implieth that thy present body 
being a design intellect having been separated from its seat, is not a body of gross matter, so that now thou hast the power to go right through any rock masses, hills, boulders, earth, houses, and Mount Meru itself, without being impeded. Even the king of mountains, Mount Meru, can be passed through by thee, straightforward and backwards, unimpededly. If we have proceeded this far still without liberation, we are again urged towards meditation. We are also warned that at this point we may see living relatives giving alms, performing religious ceremonies, or sacrificing animals in our names, which may anger or sadden us, but to be careful that such emotions could cause us to be reborn in hell. If we feel attached to worldly goods that we left behind, or because of seeing our old possessions being enjoyed and owned by other people, we should not feel jealous or upset at our successors, nor attached to our possessions any longer. We are told to renounce them and cast them away, because we can no longer possess them. O nobly born, when thou art driven hither and thither by the ever-moving wind of karma, thine intellect, having no object upon which to rest, will be like a feather tossed about by the wind, riding on the horse of breath. Ceaselessly and involuntarily wilt thou be wandering about. To all those who are weeping thou wilt say, Here I am, weep not. But they not hearing thee, thou wilt think, I am dead. And again at that time thou wilt be feeling very miserable. Be not miserable in that way. O nobly born, thou wilt rest a little while, but thou wilt not be able to remain there very long for thine intellect hath been separated from thine earth-plane body. Because of this inability to loiter, thou oft-times wilt feel perturbed and vexed and panic-stricken. At times thy knower will be dim, at times fleeting and incoherent. Thereupon this thought will occur to thee, Alas, I am dead. What shall I do? And because of such thought the knower will become saddened and the heart chilled, and thou wilt experience infinite misery of sorrow. Since thou canst not rest in any one place, and feel impelled to go on, think not of various things, but allow the intellect to abide in its own unmodified state. Finally, a grey twilight-like light will begin to shine forth at all times until the forty-ninth day. Our old life and body will start to dim as we frantically search for a new body thinking about a future life. We will be drawn towards couples engaging in intercourse, and soon find a womb to enter where we may be born again. The Book of the Dead warns us, however, to instead meditate with peace and tranquility on the vacuous clear light, which will shut the womb door. If unable to do this, we are destined for reincarnation, but first enter a judgment scene very similar to the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Both scenes feature symbolic scales of justice, but in the Tibetan version, rather than weighing our heart against a feather, a number of small white pebbles representing our good karma, and a number of small black pebbles representing our bad karma, are weighed on the scale. O nobly born, listen! That thou art suffering so cometh from thine own karma. It is not due to anyone else's, it is by thine own karma. Accordingly, Pray earnestly to the precious Trinity that will protect thee. If thou neither prayest nor knowest how to meditate upon the great symbol, nor upon any tutelary deity, the good genius who was born simultaneously with thee will come now and count thy good deeds with white pebbles, and the evil genius who was born simultaneously with thee will come and count out thy evil deeds with black pebbles. Thereupon thou wilt be greatly frightened, awed, and terrified, and wilt tremble, and thou wilt attempt to tell lies, saying, I have not committed any evil deed. Then the Lord of Death will say, I will consult the mirror of karma. So saying, he will look in the mirror, wherein every good and evil act is vividly reflected. Lying will be of no avail. Then the Lord of Death will place round thy neck a rope and drag thee along. He will cut off thy head, extract thy heart, pull out thy intestines, lick up thy brain, drink thy blood, eat thy flesh, and gnaw thy bones. But thou wilt be incapable of dying. Although thy body be hacked to pieces, it will revive again. 
the repeated hacking will cause intense pain and torture. Even at the time that the pebbles are being counted out, be not frightened, nor terrified, tell no lies, and fear not the Lord of Death. Thy body, being a mental body, is incapable of dying, even though beheaded and quartered. In reality, thy body is the nature of voidness. Thou needst not be afraid. The lords of death are thine own hallucinations. Thy desire body is a body of propensities and void. Voidness cannot injure voidness. The qualityless cannot injure the qualityless. Apart from one's own hallucinations, in reality, there are no such things existing outside oneself as Lord of Death, or God, or Demon, or the bull-headed spirit of Death. Act so as to recognize this. Similar to the Egyptian god Amit, devourer of the dead, who would eat heavy hearts off the scale of justice, the Tibetan Lord of Death dismembers and devours those deceased who fail their judgment. In fact, he repeatedly does so, not simply to punish, but to prove to the deceased that we are not our bodies. Our bodies, the judgment scene, and the Lord of Death himself are all said to be simply hallucinations emanating from our own consciousness. If we cannot realize this, we will continue to be reborn time and again. Walter Evans Wentz wrote, each deity, as it dawns from its appropriate psychic center, represents the coming into after-death karmic activity of some corresponding impulse or passion of the complex consciousness. As though in an initiatory mystery play, the actors for each day of the bardo come on the mind stage of the deceased, who is their sole spectator, and their director is karma. The higher or more divine elements of the consciousness principle of the deceased dawn first in the full glory of the primal clear light, and then, in ever-diminishing glory, the visions grow less and less happy. The peaceful deities of the heart center, and then of the throat center, merge into the wrathful deities of the brain center. Finally, as the purely human and brutish propensities personified, in the fiercest of the wrathful deities, as horror-producing and threatening spectral hallucinations come into the field of mental vision, the percipient flees in dismay from them, his own thought forms, to the refuge of the womb, thereby making himself to be the plaything of Maya, and the slave of ignorance. In other words, in a manner similar to that in which the earth plane body grows to maturity and then withers and after its death disintegrates, the after death body, called the mental body, grows from the heavenly days of its bardo childhood to the less idealist days of its bardo maturity then fades and dies in the intermediate state, as the knower, abandoning it, is reborn.